Armstrong. It's a pleasure to meet you. My pleasure, too. We're going to talk about a bunch of things, but I want to start with your story. I'd really like to start with your father's story, because I understand he was, he was a musician back in the last century before the last one. <laughs> well, music. my dad was, uh, of course, we was from Tennessee, and he, all of his life, after he came out off the farm, he was a furnace worker, I mean, an iron, a, a pig iron worker. He made cast iron, pig iron, it's blast furnace, see. And he knew quite a bit about that type of work, and practically, practically all of his life. That's what he did. He went on up till, you know, till he retired. And he made pig iron, as they call it, you know, and he knew quite a bit about that stuff. And he also played music, right? Oh, yes, well, he had... He came from a fa uh, family of uh, 15 kids. I think there were uh, uh, eight girls, I think, and seven boys. And uh, all of them, as far as I know of, played music, some type of string music, see. What, what, and what were his instruments? Uh, what was his? Yeah. Oh, he was, well, the first instrument that I saw was the one he cast aside was a mandolin, the old tater bug mandolin, they call it, you know, gourd-shaped mandolin. That's what he, they call it. That's, he played mandolin, mm -hmm. then he played a he, uh, banjo. When he joined the church, well, he gave me both of them, his old five-string banjo, plectrum banjo, and then the mandolin. Mm-hmm. So he joined the church. Um, how, roughly, how old was he when when he had this change and left music? Aside? Oh, well, he was he was just in middle of life, you know. I guess he's about forty something, maybe a little older. So why do you think he did that? No, well, I I think it was a little pressure he was under from my mother. My mother was, was very reli religious, you know, and if it put the name Jesus on it, well, well, that was just right down her alley, cause. And she had a very nice voice for singing soprano and all like that. And she's a church worker and so forth and so on. So he, for a long time, he didn't care much about, my dad didn't care much about church, you know. Then when he got a little bit older, he, you know, joined the church. And not only did he join the church, he became a pretty outstanding minister of the church. Mm -hmm. He really did. Oh. Only thing about it, my mother kept on him all the time, pressing him, you know, because he loved one certain type of reading, and that was Street and Smith's Wild West magazine. He loved that, you know. And uh, when he'd come from his job on the, at the Blast Furnace, well, he'd read uh, that magazine, you know. But Mama wanted him to keep his head in the Bible, don't you see? It's because you have to preach that Sunday. And heck, I, I had to read the Bible to my mother a lot. She loved for me to read the Bible, you know. And heck, most of the time I know my dad's commentary better than he did because he liked to read Western story magazines, you know. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it was something. But they didn't mind that even when he went into the church, it was fine for, the, for you. you had, your, your siblings also played music too, didn't oh, they? Oh, yes, yes. I was in the, actually in the middle of the family. There were four older than I and four younger. There were nine of us kids. One of my brothers, unfortunately, got killed on the railroad track, on the L&N railroad track, crossing the track. He got struck by a train, freight train or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, my dad, my mother, and my four older, uh, three older sisters, all my sisters were older than I, and one brother, he was the oldest child in the family. They they sang, you know, they had a quartet and a family group and so forth and so on. And then after my uh, mother and dad quit, you know, doing their singing, going around what they call a serenading, uh, uh, a lot of this white friends and boss men and so forth and so on. Well, then the mantle fell on me, you know. I uh, took up the brothers up under, under me, you know. Four of us brothers got together and I taught them how to play different string instruments and so forth and so on. 
I've seen that photograph that's in the uh, it's in the violin. Oh yeah, CD. well well you you got it then. Yeah. We after my dad quit the working at the blast furnace, he didn't just give up on labor altogether. He uh, put on his best bib and tucker and went back to his old thing, you know, waiting a table. And he went. We were living in this little town of Folly, Tennessee, 14 miles from Cumberland Gap, right off Daniel Boone's trail. And another town not far from that, just a little bit about the same size, you perhaps have heard about it, called Jellico, Tennessee. But we lived in the Follett. And uh, this great metropolitan opera star, that's where she was born and raised. And as my dad started to uh, going back to waiting a table and all like that in the hotel, and that's where he met her. Her name was Grace Moore. You perhaps heard of Grace Moore? Well, anyway, she got killed over in Copenhagen, Denmark, in a plane crash some years later after then. See. And uh, so my dad, after the old blast furnace shut down, you know, where he made this pig iron stuff, he, that was only 28 miles from Jellicoe. You know what I'm talking about? That, this was Le Follette. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, only 14 miles from Cumberland Gap. Well, he, he, he went up to Jellicoe and, and went back to his old first trade waiting table. And uh, he, he liked to show us off, you know. And so he had, he would have us to come up there and, uh, and play and sing music, you know. And uh, he wanted this lady, Grace Moore, since she was a famous star, to hear us play. And the smallest one in the group was six years old. I felt you saw the picture of him. There were four of us boys. And we went to Jellicoe and, and played at the Glen Morgan Hotel where he was waiting table and everything. And, of course, it wasn't... The thing for white people to call black people Mr. and Mrs. is it's just a plain thing, you know. They if they didn't call you if you were a woman and if they call you auntie, or if you were a man they, and they thought, well, I really call you uncle. Not Mr. That was that was unheard of, see. And of course, my his name was Tom, and she just it wasn't anything about Uncle Tom's cabin. She said, Uncle Tom, when she heard the kids playing and singing, what? Why don't you take these boys up north? He said, well, what's that for? <laughs> she said, well, if you get up around uh, Chicago, Detroit, uh, and in the northern cities, they'll get a better break, you know, maybe get to make records or record, do things like that, you know. And, but it, it never happened, not on him. Not, not, oh, yeah, so that, this is bef way before you, you did go to Chicago. This is when you were oh, quite oh, young. Oh, yeah, right? that, yeah, that was before, long before I went yeah. there. I'm, I'm very curious about the, the time in which your father was still an active musician back in the, what well, this would have been sort of the 1880s and 90s, right? You mean, uh, well, before I... Bef before you were born. Yeah, you know, well, was, before I was born, he, although he worked, he worked at a blast furnace. Oh, I see. So he didn't really have a big career in music. He played. No, but. He, he played, and, and I remember back in uh, this monkey town, they dubbed, you know what town that is? Monkey this town? Scope, where they had the scope trial, Charles Darwin, Origin of the Species, mm -hmm. Dayton, Tennessee, back in Ray County. That's where I was born. And uh, on the weekend when my dad come from work, or uh, wasn't even working, but usually... In afternoon, he and his old cronies would get together out in the front yard, get their old guitars, banjos, mandolins, and things, and they just have a ball, you know, and play all the old tunes and things. And I'd stand around and look and listen, you know. So finally, I got in big enough that I started playing. Then I taught my brother. It's fascinating. What I've sort of learned from the things that I've been reading and people I've been talking to um, mm -hmm. is that. After the Civil War, it seems like there was a lot of action for, for musicians, and just generally, there was a great feeling of freedom oh, in those yeah. years that that was more and more curtailed when all the Jim mm -hmm. Crow laws came in, and yes. and so by the time you get to the beginning of record making in sort of the teens and the twenties, mm -hmm. when the recording industries are really kicking in, then they mm -hmm. have this whole idea of race records and black people. Are oh yeah, what well, they couldn't they couldn't even record on the same label. 
what white musicians and black men couldn't. But in between those that time, that seems like that must have been a very interesting time. There must have been a lot of back and forth between people. And of course, by the time you get to any of these recordings, even the, the music your father played, mm -hmm. we know that black and white fiddlers and banjo players. Oh yeah, they used to get together. Yeah, they years. used to. They used to get to do ideas. that. Yeah, it really did. The way one person who wrote about this said it is that after the recording started and you had race records, people talked about black music and white mm -hmm, music. Mm -hmm. But before that, you know, for most of the 19th century, there really wasn't that. There was just music, and, and the string bands in particular oh, all yeah. played the same repertoire whether they were white or black. Do you think that's really true, or, or what do you well, think? Well, that's, that's close to it. There's a lot of uh, uh, music that blacks played that whites wouldn't deign to play at all. You know what I'm talking about? Blues? Uh, better not. You know, even even when it came on up to when I started to play blues, if we were playing for white societies and things like that, only two blues we could play. You know what they were? St. Louis blue and the Memphis blue. And then there was a, 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 a pseudo blues that came out of, of England, which weren't actually blues at all, called the Limehouse blues. You ever heard of the Limehouse Blues? All right, uh, that's that, and that's you know Benjamin Handy. You you heard of him, out of Memphis, Tennessee. Well, he he came up with this uh, with the St. Louis Blues and the uh, Memphis Blues and stuff like that. You see, and those were even when I had my group together as a young guy in my teens. Only blues we could play in white audiences among white people were the St. Louis Blues, Memphis Blues, and then if you knew the Limehouse Blues, all right. All right. Other than that, no, no. You leave it alone. I don't want to hear that. Because I remember playing one night, we, the quartet of us over there, and I see we were in Chicago. We were playing from big white up across, as black people call it, Saditi. You know what the word Saditi is? Saditi. Saditi. That means you're super elegant, you know. That's, that's as high as you can get on the scale, on social skills. <laughs> and uh, we were playing uh, for a nice group of people. At least the pay was nice. You know. And so uh, one of the guys in the group said, hey, man, so let's, let's, let's mash some good doing blues on them. Uh, I said, I don't care as long as I'm getting paid, you know. And we broke down on some old low-down, what we call low-down dirty blues, you know. And we were low road. We were cooking with the tune. <laughs> and I looked around. Here's a long, tall, redneck dude, you know, looking down on me like I came out Monday along or something. And another guy looking down, chewing on the cigar like he's trying to find a place to to stick a knife or something in me. What, hey, fella, yes. What kind of jungle ramp is that you guys pulling up there? I say, oh, we, we're playing some blues. He says, by God, you better make them red or green or something else, because I know we don't know white man won't listen to that kind of stuff. That's what they told us, you know what I'm talking about. And so that was the end of that part, see. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. It was, it was, was, it was wow. something. Big, 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 something. Do you think? You know, I mean, they always say that there really wasn't, a, there really wasn't the blues until about maybe the earliest you'd say would be the eighteen nineties, but but the teens, and they didn't really start calling it that till I guess about nineteen or eighteen or somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think about like way back before that? You know, when your dad. You was mean a what kid, kind of song did they, they have? Yeah, did they have blues? No, well, they not. African? They didn't have blues in the true sense of the blues. They played uh, 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 songs, uh, what we would call today, what some people call black songs. You know, but I don't, I don't like to say the name of what they called the song because I'll have to run out the door. See. <laughs> It's right if I tell him, Barbara. The name of the songs they call coon songs. That's what they call black people, coons and yep. things. That was a derogatory way. Absolutely. To, to, I'm, it's, I'm, you want the facts, and that's what I'm giving you. Thank you. Coon song. Yeah. 
they used to, uh, 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 I could just name a number, some, you know, some of the songs, because I didn't play them, I didn't even know them, most of them. Name a few. Well, uh, I just, like I said, I don't like to use the word if I say coon, but anyway, there was one very popular one. They called coon, coon, I wish my color would fade. Things like that, you know, it just didn't make good sense to me because my dad was the one who told me about the, the, the songs and things. But these were songs that were written by and played by black musicians among themselves? I mean, that sounds more like something well, they, they, they played. Well, they played, well, you see, playing among themselves, they didn't get much remuneration. Well, that's what my dad told me. He said they didn't get to it, and so they played them at these white dances and things like that, you know. We go play for the white audiences, and and they like like that kind of music. But always they didn't sing songs about, say, coons and stuff like that, see. Yeah. Should I pick up the phone when it rings? Yeah, you might as well. And then yeah, you just never know. Yeah, right. Because well, I have an answering machine, but... Well, all right, then. Huh? No, water is too thin, brother. <laughs> something a little hardier? Coke. Yeah, something like that. Well, you pay me, I'll get drunk. A lot of whiskey. <laughs> now, what was you want to know well, now? Well, okay, uh, what you get so curious about, especially if you listen to the African string music, mm -hmm. and you start to hear, you hear something like the way this Taj Mahal thing where, where these mm -hmm. guys gets together with these African string players and very quickly they can play each other's music. They listen a bit and they, oh yeah, okay. And they find their way very easily. And it makes mm -hmm. you think, boy, there must have been a time way back when, maybe it was a, even, you know, 150 years ago when, when there were African people who, had, who still remembered tunes mm -hmm. and things and who were making their own banjos and violins. And, you well, they, well, you know, uh, the banjo originated in Africa. You know that. And, and and a lot of people don't know, also the violin. But the violin wasn't such a polished instrument back there like it is now. Mr. Stradivarius, you know, out of Italy, would put the nice polished finishing touches on it, see. But uh, the violin, guitar, banjo, all those string instruments originated in Africa. They didn't look as polished as they do now. Because they used to play gourds. They used to make instruments, fiddles and things out of gourds and all like that, you know, back in, the, in Africa. The, yeah, the way they still do there. Yeah. So people came here and they still remembered that. But there must have been a time when they still remembered the songs, too, or something. Oh, them. yes. They, 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 they didn't remember the songs, African songs. She even sang you know, some African songs. But she won't sing them all once in a while. Let me see. What what is the little song she sang? Konjalalu. Nike. Isn't that one? Is that name it? Nike, Nike. Nike, Nike, Nike. Lu. Yeah, she 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 knows them. Mm -hmm. Well, now we can know them because we can buy them in the record store. Yeah. But 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 in in those days, I mean, if you were like if you were back in the eighteen hundred, the only way you would know them is if you were there. Oh yeah. Or if mm -hmm. you, but I guess, and then it's so interesting to think about in places like Tennessee and Kentucky, there were a lot of real sort of, um, in addition to the the blacks who had who had gotten away from slavery and were living in the mountains, mm -hmm. playing music, and then there were all these kind of rough and ready uh, Europeans who were also living in the mountains. Absolutely. And and they and they were getting together, and it must have been so. I mean, I would you know give my right arm to be able to be in one of those rooms, you know, go back All in time right. and imagine used to do what that. that must have been like, you know, when 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 those people were coming together and teaching each other. Mm -hmm. But by the time we get to the Civil War and after the Civil War, there's been a lot of that going on, and it's and you have the string band music. That's a lot of it's. European songs, but they're played in this very syncopated, Africanized way. Absolutely, the absolutely. repertoire is is mostly coming from the white side, but the, mm -hmm. the interpretation, a lot of it, is coming from oh, the yeah. African side. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a bit. Well, uh, I even up when I first started, you know, to play music, we couldn't even sit in the same waiting room with whites being black. You see what I mean? But when it came to playing music and thing, we met on rather common ground. I used to play for many, uh, and I was the youngest one in the group that before I started my own group, you know. 
that uh, played, you know, I played my fiddle, and I could play fiddle and play my mandolin, you know, with all the guys. Mama didn't, wasn't so happy about me playing. <laughs> she called them rounders, you know, guys like Andy Klein, Clarence Venable, John Dye, and all those were old. Uh, scuffling guys played uh, honky tonk stuff, you know, around black places, and played for whites and all. See, and they played all kinds of those funny songs that uh, I didn't know what half of them meant anyway, you know. But I, I could play the fiddle with them. You see what I'm talking about? Then later on, I learned to sing them and know what, you know, what they were about. Something about them. See, what'd you say your mother called those guys? Rounders and uh, skunks. And 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 uh, another, she had another word. Uh, wasn't so nice, but it, I can't think of what it is right this minute. But she, it might come to me. So is she calling that because she thought they were just low life? Say. Low life, but that's what you was. Yeah. Right, so how did you feel about these guys? What was it like? I felt them? good because a little bit dollar dollar and a quarter that I got for playing with them made me feel mighty fine. And were they nice to you? Did they seem to appreciate the way you oh, played? Oh, yeah. They caused cause the one thing I could do, I could play fast and I could play loud, you see. We didn't have electric instruments then, you know. And I had a nice repertoire, you know. And shoot. They didn't know as much as I did about the modern songs at the time. I knew all the latest songs like this kid know about this hip hop dancing and stuff, stuff, you know. Well, well, the older guys that played with me, I'm 14 years old, and those guys, 40 or 50, they they didn't know the the, the song like Brown Eyes, Why You Blue, and uh, Barney Google with the Goo 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 the Eyes, and uh, oh, I call it Rainbow Round My Shoulder, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> You know, I knew all that, you know, and, and carried it on. How did Bam. you know those songs? From your dad? No, my dad didn't know he them. Did, he didn't know either. How would you know them? Well, because like kids out there knowing this funny dance, like she got nieces and nephews, hip-hop, what they call it, Barbara? Hip-stop, I Yeah, and it's saying they know about uh, and then rap and stuff like that. It was current, you know. I see, I see. You knew it because of your, your peers and the group yeah, that you Yeah, that's were in. right. And that was interesting to those guys. All right, now. Those skunks. They wanted that. I did want it. And then uh, there was a blind guy, a black guy, used to come over to Lift Bollet from Knoxville and play on, on pay, at paydays on a street corner. And he and his, he had a string band. Oh, he, he, he could pull some longbow fiddle, you know. And they called him Blind Roland, Blind Roland Martin. He had a half brother named Carl. That's the one I played with later on, years later. And Carl played instrument I never had been up close to before in my life. Stringed instrument. Guess what it was? String bass, upright bass. He could spin it around, throw it all kind. Of, I, I would look and see it fall, and if he had missed one lick, He'd hit the ground, but he could spin it round and do all kinds of tricky things with that bass. And then nobody made pizzicato on a fiddle, I mean, especially bass, you know, the street band. Didn't. They didn't pluck the strain, but he could do that, you know. He would bow, he could do some real crazy bowing and then pluck the string. I thought he was a wizard or something, you know. But I didn't care about playing the bass. All I wanted to do play my fiddle. And old Blind Roland, would, he, he, his half-brother, he could really saw down on that fiddle. And, and you know, he couldn't see a wink. And uh, you know what he could do? He could, he could set the sound post in the fiddle and him stone blind. He set that sound post in there, and a lot of people with eyesight couldn't do that. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. String wow. his fiddle up, he string him fiddle up, he shoot, string it up good as you could and you can see. Did you know uh, Blind James Campbell? I've just been listening to some of his stuff from, Na I guess he was from Nashville. No, I, I heard him, I never met him. Yeah, yeah, he was, but I, I, I knew a lot of those guys that played around uh, yeah, sure Nashville. But one of those dudes, you know, the one, of, one of the first black guys that even they put on the radio there, you know, on the WSM. Played a harmonica, D. Ford Bailey. 
You ever heard of him? I've seen that name, D. Ford Bailey. D. Ford Bailey, a little short guy, man, and he could blow some crazy stuff on a harmonica, yeah. Nice. And then the other guys. So the harmonica, that was played then. I, don't, oh. I haven't come, come across too much of that, but that was there, right? Eh? Black guys, I'm not t- trying to take any credit or anything, but the one who put the harmonica out in the fore, right, forefront. You see, most most white guys that played a harmonica, I don't care whether they came out of sticks or mountains or cities or whatnot, they played it like you would the one of those little old push button accordion. That's what it sounded like, a miniature accordion. You know, just open notes and things on reeds, you know. But but I've seen guys, those black guys that could choke them and make it make the fox chase and make the dogs howl and uh, and and. All that kind of stuff, you know, and do all kinds of stuff. I know a big guy, a black guy that played a harmonica from up around Marstown between Knoxville and Memphis. They call him Marstown Tiger. And he, he, he was a prize fighter, too. He, you know, I told him he was a prize firefighter. That's what he was. But he could blow that harmonica. I mean, he'd make the dogs howl. He'd, 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 he'd almost make that thing talk. You could hear the hounds, you know, holler, and then he'd holler. He said, what did you say? And he'd, wow, 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 you want your meat? Wow, wow, meat, you know that, and, and he really could do that thing. That's great, and of course, that really caught on. We know there's- Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Then guys, like I told you, other guys like D. Ford Bailey and other guys began to pick up on the yeah. harmonica. You're because. still doing that stuff. And um, and uh, I know around Chicago, New York, different places like that where they had harmonicas. And they had even whole harmonica bands. White guys did. They even had bass harmonicas. Sound like a great big heavy accordion. You know what I'm talking about? They really did. I've seen one? Man, I've seen a picture. Oh, yeah. They, they, they had them, but, but they played them more openly. They they didn't choke the notes and things, yeah, and those yeah. black dudes would choke and, and get all kinds of yeah. weird sounds out of them, and they, 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 they like, people liked it. They liked it. That's great. So let's talk a bit about, about you and how you became a professional musician. I mean, from from being a kid and and having your playing with your brothers and your father taking you around and stuff like that, you eventually ended up striking up on your own and, and, and having a band in Chicago and all that. Oh, how, oh yeah. From, from well, one to the other. Well, I went, as a matter of fact, we lived in a little town, as they call uh, 41 miles from Knoxville, they call it Folly, Tennessee. 14 miles from Daniel Boone's Trail, which was just uh, not far from uh, Cumberland Gap, you know. And uh, this band, this blind man would come over, had a quartet, string quartet, play, and I'd go down there on a Saturday, you know, and if I had a little nickel or dime, I'd throw it in a tin cup, you know. It's because I liked the way he was sawing on that fiddle, you know. And so I, my dad at that time, uh, he had nine kids. And uh, he worked at a blast furnace, made pig iron, cast iron, as he called it, the pig iron, you know. And so uh, I would, uh, uh, these guys would, uh, you know, when they had payday, they knew when the, Blast furnace paid off, and when the miners got their check and everything, and they'd be over there passing the hat playing on the street corner. And I liked to hear, like the sound of the music. And so finally, uh, I, I learned at a pretty early age, you know, how to play the mandolin and fiddle. And when school would be out, something like that, would shoot, i pack my little tater bug mandolin up, and gone over into Knoxville, and I played with the group. I was 14 years old, and I played to come on back when school opened up again. And uh, the boy, Carl Martin, who played the bass, his mother was just like my second mother, you know. Yeah, all right, yeah, this is the picture, this is the famous picture of you with your brothers. Armstrong Brothers String Band. Oh yeah, that that was us, and that's in the So you're a little older here now, you 14 or? Yeah, 14. Okay. And, then, and I think he was 12, rolling number 12. Wow. So this is, this is before you, 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 you struck off on your own to... Uh, oh, that was that band here. Yeah. That's picture, man. You can see all those. Those, those are my own. 
That was my first love. You know what I'm doing? Handy. I'm down in the, under this. You see this house here? Yeah. This is old company house. That's a company house. Yeah. This is the old blast furnace. Wow, it's just nearby. Eh? <laughs> yes, yeah, just about half a mile up. down the hill. There's a bluff went around there, and <clears throat> I'd go right up under there. Here you see me inside up there. Wow. I lay on my stomach and draw pictures. That's what I would sketch. Wow. Whatever came across my, my mind. Many times I didn't even have real paint, and so I would get walnut stain to make yellow and brown. You know what I mean? Take my mother's blue and, you know, in they go and make blue, mix all that stuff up. Oh, wow. And one day I was yeah. walking along and it was raining and I saw uh, some red. I said, look at that red. It looked like blood almost, you know, running in little puddles of water. And then I looked and saw the source. It was a piece of this uh, paper, you know, this scrape paper they put around the mantel pieces and things. And if you wet it, that dye will come out. And I, it was soft. I got me some scraps of different colored paper like that. Well, then you got red. Mm hmm That's crazy. Yeah, that was a old lady. Uh, she called us up a fortune teller in Manoa. And, of course, that type of person has been long gone from the black race in America. We, they were a lot of these old guys they called country man. Oh, yeah, and could put tricks in there. New Orleans was noted for that. Oh, con conjure, yeah. Yeah, they could put tricks on you, do spells, they call You know what I mean. Wow. And uh, so, That was just disappearing when you were young. Oh, yeah. And that that's the guy's name was, they, we, Mama called him Mr. Pie and everybody else. And hated to see him come in the neighborhood. And he would write and mark saying things on the back of the house, you know, that supposed to be a bad luck him and all like that stuff, you know. He's a conjurer. The conjurer. Your mother was afraid of him. He, she didn't. She didn't. Well, she. She, she didn't feature she, that. She had enough trouble trying to raise us seven, eight kids. Now that's the old blast furnace. My dad, if he had been white, he might have been superintendent of the doggone thing because he, he, he. That's what he knew. Furnace, how to make pig iron and stuff like that. He was that. good on it. He could look and tell what. You see this whenever smoke. Yeah. Different color. Yeah. He could tell what kind of iron it was making, whether it was the furnace was working right or what. By the color of the smoke. Color of the smoke. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And uh, and he helped this uh, white man who was a foreman, a superintendent, one of them, hold his job. And that's your dad. Where? Right here, isn't that? Oh, yeah, that, that's him when he's a minister. See his Bible? Oh, yeah, right, exactly. Reverend T.F. Armstrong, Mama was so proud of him because she was so religious oh my goodness and she'd see him on a sunday or something. he'd come have his bible come be coming from the church or something and that's my father's mother wow and that's my father wow that's a really that's really going back there's a photograph mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a that's a photograph wow. of him yeah and that's his brother okay now you saw his mother yeah, over just, there. just over there, yeah. All right, now, this is, she wanted to name him something big and great, famous. And guess what? The biggest thing she could think of, guess what she named him? After the state he was born in, called him Tennessee. Tennessee. And he never would go by the name. He chopped it down to three letters. Guess Tim. what? Tim. Tim. That's right. <laughs> That's what he calls that. Who wants me named after this rebel state and can't even go vote in and all like that? Yeah. I, I always thought, think of this one when I first heard of you. I have a great uncle whose name is Howard Armstrong. Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's a wonderful name. That's, Isn't that something? Eh? That's an awful fine picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and there's the band. Mm hmm. That's my dad. You can turn it around when you can see it. You can look at it. Oh, that's your dad playing. That's my dad and uh, the family. That's the family group. That looks like a guitar there that she's playing. <clears throat> it is. That's my sister Ella. She played the guitar. Mama sang. Sister one played out, sang alto, and one sang contralto, as we call it. So, so the the guitar was was there also from way, from way back. I mean, it wasn't as common as the fiddle and the violin, was it, or was it? Well, uh, uh, what did you the, say? The fiddle and the mandolin oh. and the banjo. Those yeah. were big. Especially yeah. the banjo and the fiddle. Yeah, banjo and fiddle. Well, the guitar, it, 
it, it was kind of a town instrument, you know. A town instrument. Sedity, you know, social Oh, Sedity, okay, yeah. there we are again, yeah. Oh, and of course there was the piano. Oh, yeah, well, piano had two names, you know, the pronunciation, it spelled the same way. What was the other one, piano? Piano and piano. Piano. Either yeah. one is correct, look in your dictionary. Okay, <laughs> that'll do. <laughs> That's my There's brother Roland. Oh, he yeah. will, here he is now. See the difference in? Oh yeah, he's 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 still down there. No, he he died. Just, oh. You know when he died, Barbara? Many years ago. Well, well anyway, he could fulminate. He had his grandma intact and everything else. <laughs> he could fulminate. Oh yeah. Look at that, eh? Now this is the same. That's when he was started playing. Two years old. That's Two when he years old. He's going for that mandolin. The old tater bug my dad had. That's great. Now look what he's playing there. Guitar. Wow. LC. And he he also played in his band. With okay. Carl Martin. Oh yeah. Okay. In mm -hmm. the in the the band. It was a current. Yeah. 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 There he is over there and over there. No, that's, that's this is the other one. This is Francis. This now. is I mean FL. That's the one I'm from. Oh, we did LC. Now we're in. Mm -hmm. FL was missing for years. Mm -hmm. was, missing. We just found him in a gig we were playing in California. Is that right? Yes. Like recently. Uh, two mm -hmm. years ago. They were reunited after years. Ago. That must have been. Something. He didn't know he was still living. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's great. Wow. What a thing. Amazing. That's my but, baby sister, Robbie. Uh, you see what's up there in the mouth? It looks like a gold tooth. That's what it is, a gold tooth. Plated tooth, yeah. yeah. That was the thing. If you had a gold tooth in your mouth, you couldn't hardly keep your mouth shut. Yeah, back. it looks like she was into showing it off, yeah. That's well, that's great. what I'm talking about. That's what they did, showed it off. <laughs> Why not, eh? If you got it. Oh, Spread my it. goodness, they sure did. Wow. So, okay, well, well, a little diversion there. That's excellent, though. I learned a lot. So we're at the point in, in, in your story where you're, you, you're now going over after school and playing with these guys on the street. Did you think that that was going to lead towards a career, or were you just amusing yourself? No, I'm just, I just like to play music. And uh, the guy I played in, in a band with was Carl's half-brother, and he was a blind man. Mm -hmm. And so I played in the quartet, and then finally we pulled away Carl and I did and started our own band. We would call it Tennessee Chocolate Drop. You, I guess you heard about it. Originally. You had that name right, right from the start, eh? Well, not exactly right from the start because, <laughs> uh, but we did in Knoxville. We, we played over W-R-O-L, let's see, W, uh, yeah, W-R-O-L, that was it. And W-N-O-X, and it was so funny, every time we get ready to broadcast, we had a money Nice outside audience, you know, in the barber shops, the pool room, and everything. I had an old buddy named Gene Watkins that ran the barber shop on Vine Street. Now, you boys, we, he knew we were going to broadcast. Knock them cold. I said, Oh, we're going we gonna to burn the hide off them, you know. And so when we'd come back, well, I said, How did it sound? Oh, you guys were cooking. You guys were cooking, you know. All I had to do was. I saw a piece of sheet music. I'd read the music off. How'd you learn to read music from your dad? Well, not exactly from him, but I learned how to play from him. Mm -hmm. Start with the, when I started playing, I wasn't reading, but later on, I learned. I taught myself how to read okay. music. You know, so we take a piano score. We call it. You know, most sheet music even today is written just for pianos. You know, I mean. Of course, now they got it for whole bands and everything, see. And I just take the piano score and pick out the treble, play on the fiddle or whatever. Get the melody. And all like that. And so we bought this new song that just come out. And it was on a piano score. And the name of it was, I Miss a Little Miss Who Misses Me in Sunny Tennessee. And it was a cute little song, you know. And I'd usually run over it about twice. So I'd soon throw the music in the garbage. It didn't matter because had it down, you know. And so we had to broadcast that particular day. I don't know what it was, Friday or Saturday. And so the man, all our fans were listening. It was about 2 o'clock, I guess, in the day. 
and they were naturally going to tell us how it sounded when we came out, you know, back on the street. And so we had this uh, song, you know, we'd rehearsed it, my brother, and, and we had a quartet, excuse me, four of us. And uh, the man said, now we're going to have this little song, which is entitled, uh, I miss a little miss who misses me in sunny Tennessee. I knew every word, every line of it till the man caught it. My mind went just as blank as a red sea. I couldn't, I couldn't think uh, bump, beep, we wang and bang. We went from, ran the scale from one end to the other, you know. We didn't miss a note, but we didn't hit the right ones in the song, you know, trying to get to start. And then we usually play in introductions to song. We, that's what we do, you know, play, play introduction and then play the rest. And so, and what was so funny, my brother Roland, one next to me, chewed tobacco. Young as he was, now he chewed tobacco. And he come over to me, you know, and he was the bass player. And he no one tried to whist, whistle the tune, you know. He, he couldn't sing worth anything, but he was going to whistle the tune. And he went to whistle the, the tune so I would get to start and got choked on this tobacco. <laughs> and I got tickled, and the man who was announcing got tickled and everything. And it just jumped right in my mind just like that. And we made, we, we made a nice program. And the guy, when we got back on a big stroll on that Vine Street, all the guys in the barber shop, man, you guys were cooking today, but hey, that first song that, that you guys sang about you miss that little gun made missing me in Tennessee, that was the damnedest introduction ever I heard. We went way around Joe Bond, come on back up by the haystack and everything else. I said, you don't know how near you come not getting that song. But we didn't boo-boo, we made it. That's great. So you're playing live on the radio. That was There were no records then, right? Oh, there were records. Oh, there were yeah, records. By yeah. So where, where are we now? We're sort of late 20s? It was in Knoxville, yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, yeah, there were records. Well, there That's were records what we see. They yeah. had Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and all that bunch, you know, was made uh, made uh, records. And even big white band like Paul Whiteman and those guys, oh, they had records, yeah. So, but this is before the Depression, though, so the late 20s? Yeah, that, that was that. You got it just right. Yeah, okay. Just before the Depression. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, oh, wow. And so did you make any money doing that? They pay you for playing on the radio? Oh, they paid us, but the, but the chump change, that's yeah. all it was. Yeah. So they, 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 you, we, you'd be surprised, a musician especially, small bands and things were ripped off more than you. You have no idea how we were ripped off. We we made records up for the Brunswick Recording Company, you know, and they had the OK Record Company, and they sold tons of those things. They ground them out and sold them, but they gave us, compared to what they got, we didn't get anything hardly. She yeah. knows about that. Well, I'm sure that's true. That's what In they those did. days, there was nobody blowing the whistle on them. No, and then uh, it was a lot of street musicians, you know, and it was an honor to be chosen, you know, to play on the road. We're going to make a record. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Make the man halfway rich, and we didn't have a court hardly. And that's the way it was, yeah. you know. Yeah. So you eventually left and, and did go up north. The way oh, that yeah. Was. was that before or after the Depression started? That was after... That was after it was over, to tell the truth. Oh, really? Yeah. So you spent the Depression still in Knoxville, pretty much? Uh, well, partially, yeah. but, but I went to Chicago and met other musicians and things. That's when we started to so make it out. So you went to Chicago during the Depression? Yes, you what, might call it. What year, roughly, roughly? Roundabout? Well, that was back in the late 30s, up okay. in the 30s, the 32, 4, and all like that. Well, uh, it was a few years before I went on the seas. Before they bombed Pearl Harbor, I was there in 1941, December the 7th. You were in Pearl Harbor? I was there when Tojo came with his big black plane and the orange colored ball on the side. Oh my God. 
God. We'll look at that one after. <laughs> Leave it there, yes. Well, thank you, baby. <laughs> That's great, yes. Barbara, you must have a... Now, you see, you all wrapped up like your coal and everything, and then you must have half the one in the house open. Lord have mercy. I'm sitting here shivering like shivering? a... Shivering? Like a country dog eat, eating peach seeds. <laughs> Well, I don't know how you stay so hot. I wish I had some of your body temperature. Where'd Bob go? Oh, yeah. Now, I, I read in, uh, I guess it was in the notes for the Louis Bluey CD, that this great story about how when you went up to Chicago, um, I guess that was with the Tennessee Chocolate Drops, the guys who mm -hmm. were in that group, mm -hmm. went up to Chicago. And... Um, and it was pretty tough making making a living on the street, so so you, you went into some of the Polish and Italian neighborhoods, and you oh. were able to speak a bit of oh, their language, yeah. and that made you made you able to sort of get their attention. That was Talk about a, that a little bit. Well, I would all the street musicians, you know, the black ones I'm talking about, like to follow me and my buddy because we could get little go in places and get. To play and pass the hat, where they wouldn't even let the others come in. And so uh, we'd go out on the north side, gambling the verse in different places on those avenues, you know. And I, I know we went to one place and I saw a sign, La Casita. It's Italian, means a little house or their hut, you know. And I said, come on, boy, let's go in here. We, we call this skiffling. You didn't have a uh, 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 you know, a, a assignment or anything to play there. You know, we didn't have a gig there, but uh, just go there and ask could you play some music and then pass the hat. They said, oh, man, I, we don't want to go. That's Italian joint. We don't want to go in that place, man. You can't. I said, it's bad Italian money spent like any other kind. And I was brought up when I was nine years old. I was speaking Italian grammatically better than it was English in many ways. How come? Because I played with the little Italian kids and things, and then what they didn't learn was what I learned. I learned how to read the stuff. You know, even though Tennessee had the separative laws, race law, I'd go to the house and eat pot lamps and everything else, you know. And uh, the guy's daddy or uncle says, the guy's take me, I want you to meet my uncle. And he would have the paper... Il Popolo Bulletin de la Sera, the People's Evening Bulletin, or La Tribuna, you know, the Tribune, and oh, well, shoot, that was the I main thing. I'd, and they just tickled him, you know, that the little black boy was doing that, you know. And so when we would be out on the north side of somewhere, somewhere in Chicago, I saw the big sign up there, you know, this club, it's La Casita, you know, the little house or the hut, you know. Man, we can't go in that ass Italian. I don't care if it's Jap Italian. Let's go. Well, you lead the way. I'm like a hot headed little fool. I got it right in front, and we go down. It was in the basement, like. I had to go down a little slant down the steps and things. And uh, it was when we got inside, it was just hazy with these little cigar, crooked cigar, black cigar they sm spoke, smoked, you know, they call them stogas or something. But anyway, I came, I was in front and guys behind me, you know. And um, and I looked around, here was a great big Harry Chester Sicilian on one side, and one on the other was chewing a little crooked cigar. <laughs> what you come here for? I said, well, we want to play some music. We well, don't want to hear that blow, you know. And a little devil or something seemed like stuck his tail in my ear. I said, well, why don't you talk Italian to him, fool? And I whipped my Tennessee Italian on them, and the whole atmosphere changed. They were made a place for us to play and everything. And 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 the odd part about it, I got to sing. I knew a few Italian. I mean, songs that I could sing in Italian, and and that just amused them no end. I started singing uh, "Oh Marie," and uh, uh, and and "Old Soul of Me." That was old hat. You know, wouldn't want that same thing, I you know. Que la cosa na yenate sole, you know, la real fresca parejana face and all that stuff, you know. Whoever has seen a black Italian before, you know, and they did, that just tickled them. I said, boys, we saved. And uh, we started, they cleared off the place for us to play and everything. 
And then uh, the guys could back me up good on the music part, you know. But when it came to singing uh, Italian words, well, they, 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 they try to join in on the chorus. When I say singing "Oh Marie," they say "Oh my leg, oh anything," they don't care. And the, and they were all full of that dago red, that Italian liquor, you know. And the guy said, "Ah, oh, your boys are singing nice Italian." <laughs> And they'd all ask, they you know when they come to see that old part, they'd have to say, oh, anything, you know. Your boys sing nice Italian. That's incredible. So through doing that, you were you were able to get some work and sort of oh, man, make I'm things just, happen. We got to pay that dollar, and, easy, got that dollar and a half rent, pay that dollar and a half rent a week, you know. And had money in our pockets and oh, we, we did just good. So now it's just sort of moving up towards the war when you went went to the war um things were go things were starting to sort of go okay there in chicago or at least uh -huh. half decent yeah well i went i went um down back down south went back to my home state tennessee and i went to sparta and got married you know and then i went over to uh pearl harbor see and that was that was something at pearl harbor you were there when the bombing happened. Yes, and I'm telling you, you hear people talk about uh, war and things, you know, all the glory. There's no glory in war. Glory when you stay out of it. Or if you get in it and get out and don't get hurt, shot of. Yeah, I guess you were it. lucky to walk away from that one. I eh? sure was. Because I saw black planes, you know, the just Japanese uh, planes that were painted black and had a big orange color ball on it. I saw a little Hawaiian kids throw a ball up high than the plane was flying. Really. It, 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 it. And that those things were cruising out there, you know, the big Zeke's, they call them, zeros. And, and, and some people, they strafed in the street. But I was lucky enough. It was happened to be, you know, it was two days you look forward to when you work for for the government, you know, in civil service. See, I wasn't in the Army or the Navy. Many day I wish I had been, because I would have known maybe a better way to take care of myself. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But uh, we, we were in the Naval Contonement. They had quarters for us to live and all like that, you know. What were you doing? What was your what was your job? I was working at, uh, at the Naval Yard. I, in fact, I was working in the paint department. I did not too much different from painting automobiles and things, you know. Okay. And my trade was sign writing. I did all kinds of sign writing. And, right. and it stood me in good st But I'm telling you, you don't, you hear people talking about glory and why there's no glory and no why you stay out of it. So. It's a brutal <laughs> thing, I'm telling you. Yeah, wow, that's quite something. So how long were you over there in, in Hawaii? About two years. Did you play it all when you were there? Oh, yes. I shoot it after the thing was over. It was bumming. We still were there, you know. Yeah. I, I met a bunch of... Uh, I made some very nice friends. I'd go down to the mission church. There were a lot of Hawaiians and, and so forth down there. Played. I played in the church for them on Sunday. And then uh, the, the, there were two people that... They turned their nose up at you know. They isolated a lot. Were uh, uh, the Filipinos and the American Japanese? They didn't care what kind of Japanese you were. They, they didn't care too much about you. And there were a lot of these Japanese were Christians, were nice people. And I would uh, I was a guy named Nishiko. He and his wife. They looked like little old dolls to me almost, you know. And they had been taking me. Uh, 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 a lesson from uh, some American white guy. It would not give them any more lesson on the violins. They wanted to be learn how to play violin. They were doing pretty good. And I went to the mission church and met them, you know. And I went, I told my sister, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a violin lesson. Well, what you charge us with? I said, I don't charge you anything. But they were very nice to me and they gave me a and I wish I knew what happened to the violin. They gave me a beautiful violin, you know. And somebody made it disappear. <laughs> oh, boy. 
Yeah, you talked about in the notes there that you you wish you still had that first violin that your father and you made. Too. Oh yeah, I wish I wish that I did. That was one of those gourd violins. You said that mm-hmm. it had a it wasn't a gourd. It was no. It was carved out of a it was a box. He carved it. He carved. It. He told me to go downtown and look in the trash. You know, behind the buildings. You know, furniture stores and grocery stores. They, they had a lot of pine boxes. What they you know boxed up merchandise and things. Then you know and they throw boxes out. You know. Grocery stores, or whatever kind of stores, you know. And so I be told me to get a nice pine box and bring it back. In which I brought it back. And he and it was nice thin slabs of wood in it. And he took a pocket knife, carved me out the nicest little old fiddle that you ever saw, and carved a neck out of another piece of wood and all like that. And she painted it. They used to have varnish you could go to the store and get they called Japalak and stuff like that that had the pigment already in this. Now, most of the time, you just get clear varnish and put it on stuff. But when he painted me a nice red mahogany, I loved I practically slept with that dog on fiddle, you know. And it sounded good, eh? You said it had a real rich sound. Yeah, it really was nice. And you don't know what happened to it? Yes, I know what happened to it, but... My old thievish professor, his name was Dick Upton from Sweetwater, Tennessee. Well, that was, I don't know how many of them are. It wasn't all that far from the folly where I lived, but it was further than I wanted to walk. And uh, so he, he, he said he wanted to show it to some of his friends or something. He took it, and I haven't seen it from that day to this. Wow. Somebody said he gave it to his old son or something. So. But he wasn't married, but he had some little wood coats and things, you know, but some of the women around there, see. A lot, lot of violins over the years, eh? <laughs> well, uh-huh. I don't know about the violin, but uh, he sure got mine. Wow. Well, what about the mandolin? You, uh, When you first heard the violin, you wanted to leave the mandolin aside, but you ended up coming back to the mandolin. Oh, yeah, I, was, I, I carried both along with me. I played the mandolin and the violin. And guitar, and I eventually wind up, wound up playing. I guess about twenty different instruments. Wow! Especially stringed instruments. And yeah, that. yeah. No, well, I, from what I've heard, it sounds great. It's fantastic. And and let's go back again to the sort of the music and the repertoire, because by the time I guess after you came back from Hawaii, mm-hmm. did you come back to Chicago? Yes, yes, I did. I came to Chicago for a minute, so to speak. Then I came on back over to where I was living with my mother and dad till they followed. Now I had a brother played the guitar L.C. 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 was kind of wild, you know. He he was always getting into something. He had a friend in Sparta, Tennessee. He was a school teacher, Steve Roberts. And Steve wanted him to come down there and play in the band. He had a seven-piece band or something like that, see. And I was, I had no attachment or anything there in the pilot. Mama said, and Dad told me, said, well, why don't you go in your brother's place, you know? So I did, because uh, Steve's daddy and my dad were went to school together in Tennessee, Dayton, Tennessee, you know. And so I went on down there and got some roots around the next thing, you know. I was married, and I had a, my first son was, right there in Sparta. And the black people and the white people, I, I felt like a prince or something. And I, I told you, you know, a while ago that I did lettering, gold leaf and all kinds of brush work with sign work, you know. And the, and the Cumberland Amusement Company, which owned the Olin Theater, had a lot of that poster work and stuff, the, the, the little one sheets and two sheets and plaques and things to be put out. And they just gave me a studio built in in, in the basement. And man, I shoot that that kept being my my wife and my son when he was born, you know, kept us going. I had me a studio down there. So you, man. Had, you had a business with the signs. Yeah. You still, you had, did you have the band then? Was the tennis the chocolate drop? No, I would play see I played in another band, Steve's band, Steve Roberts. Steve and his New York Rhythm Boys, mm-hmm. seven pieces of us. And you couldn't guess what instrument I played most of the time in there. 
Bass fiddle. Bass. Oh. I would do solos on a fiddle every once in a while, you know, make a tick or something, but I was playing bass. Now, was this a different kind of music, or was this more, what kind of music what were you into It was there? a modern music, you know. But it, so you are into the sort of the yeah. blues and to ragtimey jazz uh, Whatever, and like all that. that, whatever it all for the You had a swing by then, aren't you? Swing, yeah. that's all, yeah. man. It was, of course, I was playing the stuff of, long before I went there, you know, but I didn't have a band, a seven, with seven pieces in a band. Wow. And the boy who had the band, uh, Crockett Officer, his dad, for years, had a band for uh, Ringling Brothers Circus. He was the bandmaster for that circus for years. And so uh, his son, uh, Crockett Officer, one that uh, had this little band, I'm in the seven pieces, you know. D.C. Officer was the old man, you know, played heavy stuff and stuff. And I got hitched, so to speak. I got married and everything. And for years, I stayed there. So you stayed with that for, for quite a while. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, I read about a time when, I mean, even before the war, when you were still playing the string band music, you were one of the only groups that was still able to play that music. It must have been mm -hmm. a bit tough. To, oh. But you did get recorded, eh? Oh, yeah. Even though it wasn't, didn't sort of fit the pattern of the race records of the time, that they wanted to no. hear blues. And yeah, they wanted to hear... Well, as a matter of fact, they made this documentary. You know about that, didn't you? Yeah, I haven't seen it, actually, but I, I will. I'm looking for it. Yeah, called Louis Bluey. Yeah. I've heard the CD. Oh, dear. Love the CD. <laughs> All right. I like the... There's a lot of... It's very great. The music's wonderful. Well, that's but that that's that that that's that was made what fifteen years ago or so. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. At the time that was made, you you were playing with this this group with Martin and Bogan and is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I played uh, sporadically with them. Bogan was little bit. Bogan did. Martin did, and the son. I'm the only one that uh, was in the group that's living. My son Tommy, you saw his picture. In yeah, the yeah. But when you were playing that stuff, I mean, were you playing that stuff sort of in the fifties, sixties, and seventies? What were you playing during those years after between the war and the movie? What were you? What were you well, playing? we played just whatever came on, current songs, you know, popular songs, and mm -hmm. the old ones too. Yeah, we played a lot of old songs. Some of the songs I composed myself, you know. Most of those years, the 50s and 60s, and where, where were you living then? Well, I was living in Detroit. I yeah. was there where I was married the second time. Mm -hmm. My sons that are living now, they're living in Detroit now. Will, Robert, Ralph. You might have, I don't know whether you ever heard him, Ralph or not, he was a musician among the group outside of Tommy. Mm -hmm. And he was a bass player. He's way out. He's really a substantial bass player. And he played with uh, uh, John Luke Ponte and that group, you know. His so name was John McLaughlin. Oh, right. That's right. Mm -hmm. They worked together exactly. Yeah, the right. Eastern Orchestra. All right. All your right. your son played there. Yeah. Oh, oh that is yeah. Substantial, Ralph. Yes. Ralph. They called him the baby bass player. He played upright bass and plays it yet. Actually, when I play on a play with them, you know, we play on a gig, you know, be about four or five of us. I can't play my fiddle, couldn't play my fiddle for watching him. You know, he's a show off, I'm telling you. But he'd be playing, you know. I mean, I said, where did he learn that? You know, making snakes, lizards, and everything <laughs> all over the neck of that blame instrument. That's amazing. It really is. <clears throat> yeah, music is something that's in you. I don't care how much they write, how much you read, but the real stuff comes from here. That's great. I want to get back to this idea that the African-American contribution to all the string music mm -hmm. that now everybody thinks of as white music, like country music. Did you ever feel like when you were playing still these old songs from when you were young and then mm -hmm. things you'd picked up along the way, at a time when it was expected that if you were a black musician, you were supposed to play the blues. Did you ever feel like you were kind of out on your own doing something that was kind of against the grain? Not really, because hey, I was more or less a rebel anyway. You know what I'm talking about. You were happy there. I played music. If it's a song I like, I don't care whether it was uh, uh, Ridge Runners or whatever kind of stuff, uh, 
black American song, blue, jazz, and I played it. And and usually I would look over the audience, you know, see, you can just about feel what they want to hear, you know. What kind of a group have you got now? Well, it's just just sporadic, you know. I play, we just get it together, we get a gig, you know, uh, to go and play well. It's uh, two white guys play with us. And she plays the percussion, and I play, of course, the lead and everything. And it, 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 it clicks real nice. What kind of repertoire do you do now? It's pretty extensive, you know. We, we, we got some nice little stuff in there. We, we sweeten it up with the, every once in a while with a few blues, a couple of blues numbers and all like that, too. And we play current songs, you know. that. Whatever you like, just like always, eh? Oh yeah, more or less. That's that's right. Mm-hmm. But what about this whole sort of overlooked element of the the African American contribution to country music and bluegrass and string music? Um, what would you what, what would you want to say about that to someone who is sort of like, huh? I don't know what, what's that all about. Well, uh, the way I see it, um, you know, although the state I came out of, Tennessee, was they had separated laws and things like that, but that's one element you could use to bridge, to get away from that, more or less. If you played the music, you could play with the white musician, whether they came out of the knobs or countries or the, wherever they came from, up, you get together. And usually it was a mixture of uh, blue, jazz, whatever, country song. We, we, we played all of it, you know what I'm talking about. It was no trouble. In, and it mixed, put, blended pretty good, pretty nice. But you must have been aware as you were getting older and, 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 and the record companies were sort of forcing this separation of what mm-hmm. who recorded what. You must have been aware that there was something not quite right about that. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I know that, yeah. I can tell that easy enough. But after all, as my old friend... Devonport, a little guy, soft shoe dancer. We used to call him Uncle Deb in Chicago. He said, well, a lot of things you may not like, you know, in the field, but hard times make a monkey eat red pepper. So <laughs> you go along with it, shut up, or whatever you're going to do, go into that way. But don't you think that now, looking back on it, when you know we can, things are more open now. That yeah. There's some. There's something that has to be sort of set right just to have the history. Right? Oh yes, that is true. That's true. Because a lot of the guys now don't even know it. You see, the guys call us up. They do more talking than singing. What they call rap and all like that. See, they they don't know the history of where they came from, and and don't care where they're going. Looks like you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I know some of these questions are sort of looking at how you felt about the musical environment and the industry at different times. But it sounds like you've always just kind of adapted what it, what it, you you do oh, what yeah. you want to do and you find a place where people want to hear. Accept it. That's it. That was it. I remember one time I was playing in Hawaii, up in Honolulu, and uh, you know I, I didn't have black musician. I had one black guy came out of Pittsburgh. And he was my guitar player. And I had two Hawaiian guys. We played downtown Honolulu and everything. And I told, I, I whispered to the guys, hey man, said, you could tell that this fellow, it had, wasn't long after they had bummed Pearl Harbor. And this young white dude, you could tell he was homesick it could be. I said, uh, we we not, we're going to play something to kind of get next to the guy, make him feel at home. And I broke down on one of those old uh, Tennessee Mountain tunes, you know, about she's my curly head baby. And I never saw such a transformation come over a guy. Then he come up to the podium one of the ways, and the man, tears were in his eyes. I said, you sound like... I was playing most of it to Hawaiian guys anyway, you sound like them people we got down home. I said, what? You know, he must have taken me for Hawaiian too, you know. I said, what's down home? Where's down home? Tennessee? I could have told him what street he lived on if he had any street or what shack he lived in almost. You know? 
yeah, you sound just like them. And so I just appreciate that song you played. He must have known that I played it for him. I said, well, I got another one we're going to play for you. And we played another one for him. So well, if he thought you were Hawaiian, then I can understand why he'd be yeah, surprised. Well, well, see, he had, <laughs> well, he had heard us. Yeah. We had played, we've been playing Hawaiian songs and we're singing. You never find another Kanaka like me and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And and then when we played the song "She's My Curly Head Baby" and "Silver Hair Daddy," and that was that just tore him up. He could. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of people that you could play for. You must have had this experience even in America at times, mm -hmm. where people think that all those mountain tunes and everything are something that only white fiddlers play, and then they hear you playing it, and they go, and then they're surprised. I mean, I'm that, telling you, really, experience? that's right. Because see what they don't if they know the history. Many, many black slaves who were slaves were musicians, and they had they were special privilege among the other slaves. They didn't have to go out there and get all that cotton and do a lot of hard work if they were the master's music uh, band. They played for his guests and all like that, and were honored, so to speak. You know what I mean? That's why they they learned to play all the songs, Scotch songs, Irish songs, and all like that. See. And uh, around Chicago and places like that, we got nice reception because we played the kind of songs that people wanted. We played Polish songs, old barracks and, and mazurkas and all like that, played Russian songs, played German songs, sang them in German. And, you know, we had a black Deutsch one before, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew some of that stuff because it had come to you through that whole tradition that oh, you grew right. up in. That's right. Of course, what's so interesting is the way, I mean, I can just imagine the scene, you know, some white musician teaching sort of privileged slaves how to mm -hmm. play, and then they hear how they play it. Yeah. And they're, and they're uh, the, the whole process of taking these Scotch and Polish and Irish songs and, mm -hmm. and sort of Africanizing them is very interesting to me. Um, and I really wonder what the reactions must have been of those those uh, the white folks when they first heard mm -hmm. how the music came back to them, you know? That's right. It must have been quite something. Yeah, because I know, uh, I think I mentioned a while ago, Grace Moore, this great metropolitan opera star. And uh, she was all oh, really elated and surprised to hear my group play and sing the songs that she was used to, you know. My dad was waiting at the table there in uh, Jellico, Tennessee, Grand Market Hotel. And he wanted to show us all, so we only lived 28 miles from there. And he had us to come up on the bus, and we played and sang for our group. And my little old baby brother, you saw his picture, I think, yeah. over there. Yeah. That's when kids first started to wear long pants, you know. We used to, when I was his age, I had to wear knee pants, knickers and things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, some, uh, there was some trap. we called them drummers, you know, traveling salesmen. And uh, they took his pants, and he was a baby, and tied them down at the bottom. And he, my dad wouldn't allow us to wear a belt, so we were suspended. And those guys, those traveling salesmen would pull his pads up and drop money down in there, you know. But I kept my eye on every penny, you know. <laughs> when we oh, got it back tying the, got it okay. back home, I turned them upside down. Money went everywhere. <laughs> they gave me this money. I don't care if they didn't give it to you. They just letting you hold it a while, that was all. <laughs> we gonna give this money to mama. And we, it would be a payment on that little shack we lived in every wow. day. So you were helping out by playing. Oh yeah. yeah That's yeah. what we were doing. Why wouldn't your dad let you wear a belt? Well, I don't know. He had some people had a fun idea that kids shouldn't wear a belt if something grows or something. You know, some okay. old wives' tale or yeah, something. Yeah, funny. Huh. That's wild. So even in those days, back when you played for that opera singer, um, Grace uh, Moore. Grace Moore, yeah. Th there were pe people didn't realize about the black string bands. They didn't realize that there were these. Black well, well, uh, play all stuff, <coughs> no, a lot of them didn't know it, you know, Even especially then. in a small town. Yeah. But uh, there used to be plenty, even back out of the turn, at the turn of the century, and the very good black songwriters and things. Yeah. 
Now, my dad had a brother-in-law, Willie Wyndham. He used to sing opera and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, in the theaters and places. So music has no color, nothing like that. You talk about soul. Soul is in what you can do. Comes from here, like you said. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, I think that's great, Howard. Thank you very much. I, I really, all right, really appreciate it. That's all right. My pleasure. <laughs>